Book 18 gives us another great little recognition scene. Um, we get another beggar, Iris, I-R-U-S. What on me? It is 525, book 18, right at the start. Uh, what, uh, uh, Natalie, Natalie, where are you? Natalie, Natalie, Natalie. Hi, Natalie. How are you? Uh, what happens when the two beggars meet? What's that? Odysseus is one beggar, Eris is the other. What happens when they meet? You don't know? Oh, it's a big scene. It's a great scene. They come together, and Eris uh, has his poaching grounds. This is, uh, you know, this is his room. He works it every day. He is their house beggar. When Odysseus moves in, He's like, you know, this, this new guy is fleeching, fleecing my guys. Uh, I'm, this is my territory. He's, uh, he's moving in. If he is going to take more, I am going to get less. So he does not take this well. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Eris has, that's his room. He's, I'm the beggar here. I, uh, I shuck around and serve these, you know, drunken oafs all day long, and I, I'm not going to share. Um, so, the contrast is set up very clearly, and... Antonus, always kind of clever, using that cleverness in a way to divide people, pitting them one against the other. Here he does it very literally. He says, listen, suitors, great stomach stuffed with fat and blood are roasting over the fire for dinner. Let the beggar who wins the fight choose one of these and take it, and he can always eat with us in the future. And we will let no other beggar come to share our company. So automatically, he's saying, hey, let's have a fight. And he's offering them goat stomach stuffed with fat and blood, which is not the prime cut of meat, I got to tell you. Uh, that probably tastes pretty disgusting. But, you know, if you're a beggar, eh, beggars and choosers, you know what I'm saying? So they come up with this idea for a fight. And Odysseus, again, well, he met this, always thinking. They all agreed the strategist, the strategist, interesting epithet, Odysseus deceived them, saying, My friends, there is no way a man as old as me, worn down by suffering, can fight a younger man. Yours is a little younger. My hunger forces bad choices. He mentions hunger in his belly a lot, referencing his humanity and the natural tug that it means to be a man. Uh, my hunger forces bad choices, tempting me to take the beating, but swear a mighty oath that none of you will step in, will step up to help Iris out and hit me roughly with fists and make me lose to him. Swear an oath. He is extracting a contract. And think about it. A contract. That's a sign of civilization. That's a sign of understanding consequences and organizing social interaction upon a notion of consequences. Something bad might happen in this fight. Let's just say at the beginning, these are the ground rules. That's how civilizations begin. That's how people start getting along. He is 
a agent of civilization here, an agent of reason. He is saying, let's think about this, because he is thinking about this. Instead of just, you know, going at and, all right, it was fun. No, let's, what happens after the fight? If I, as this withered old man, happen to kill this guy, and everybody's probably chuckling. <laughs> uh, if that happens, let's all agree, you're not going to all gang up on me to defend him because he's kind of your pet. Smart. Hey! Hi. Sorry. What uh? What happens in the fight? Uh, it's not just, you know, it's not a close call. It's not a decision fight. It's a knockout. And, you know, the, uh, I do love this. Uh, Antonus taunts them a little bit more. These words increased in shakiness. Line like 88. Escorted to the ring, he stood. Both raised their fists. Odysseus, who had endured so many insults, Wondered if he should hit him hard enough to kill him. Again, always thinking. Thinking in terms of consequences. How bad do I want to hurt this guy? And will it hurt my cause if I just really lay him out? Always wrestling with this. Or give just a light tap to knock him down. And of course, uh, he doesn't really uh, torture himself with this discussion too much. You can see the ego, perhaps charging up in him. His plan of sneaking in and staying under the radar as much as po uh, possible kind of goes by the wayside at this point because they came to blows. First, Eris hit Odysseus's shoulder. Odysseus punched Eris on the neck below the ear and broke his jaw. Red blood gushed from his mouth with a moan. He fell, teeth chattering, legs flailing. One punch. That is not flying under the radar. We already had this great reveal just before that when, you know, all right, they're setting up a little ring sort of, and you see Odysseus, the, the frail old man, go and start to strip the rags off of himself, and everybody goes, Ooh. the old guy's kind of cut. What, uh, what gives? He's, he's not so frail. Revealing massive thighs and sturdy shoulders, enormous chest. And, or mighty shoulders, enormous chest, and sturdy arms. You know, another Hollywood moment. It's like, quite honestly, it's like the, the really cheesy movies when, uh, when the homely girl takes off her glasses and is suddenly a supermodel. <sighs> you can almost see the slow-mo getting played out right here. Yeah, man. I think he's directly gonna like, talk him so hard, and that's why he made that plan in the beginning. Yeah. I think he knew that, yeah, I, 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 I'm going to lay this, this old bastard out. <laughs> he gives me thinking to everything. Yeah. He doesn't let too much get ahead of him. There's a struggle, but how much of a struggle is undetermined? And it's really left up to us to say, well, okay, here I can see he's really struggling. Here maybe he's just putting up, you know, a good imitation of struggling because... We know what he wants to do. Uh, <laughs> but then he meets another slave, Melantho. Melantho is a slave girl, one of the servants of Penelope, a sister of Melantheus who is the herder who kicked him at the beginning. So we've already got this sense of Melantho and Melantheus, brother and sister, both slaves, and they're both uh, kind of mean. Melantho, it is pointed out very early, that was, um, was largely raised by um, Penelope. Line like 320, pretty Melantho, child of Dolius, had been brought up by Queen Penelope, who gave her toys and treated her just like a daughter. 
But Melantho, unconcerned about Penelope, was sleeping with Eurymachus. So she is sleeping with the um, with the suitors, presumably primarily this one, but perhaps anyone. Now, you can look at that a couple of different ways, and the text is a little bit uncertain about how to deal with this. Uh, Melantho is a slave. Eurymachus is an aristocrat. What right does she have to say, not tonight, I have a headache? When they say sleeping with, which is a quaint little euphemism, uh, she has no power at all. Um, you can argue about definitions of rape, but here the power dynamic is irrefutable. She cannot say no. That's not always clear in the text. She is, however, a slave. Again, some of the older translations will use delicate terminology like handmaiden, which makes it sound very Victorian. But she's a slave. She has no rights. But it is very clear I would say that the text is setting her up as uh, a bad person. Whether or not you believe in the uh, sleeping with, um, uh, with Eurymachus as a sign of that evil, uh, she is being cast as a bad slave. She talks back. To, uh, to Odysseus as the old beggar. She um, talks behind Penelope's back. Presumably, letting Eurymachus rape her is a sign of disloyalty. Um, but we see a real contrast of her and her brother, Melanthius, with Eumaeus. Eumaeus is the almost too loyal to believe slave, you know, who after 20 years of his boss being absent still pines for his boss's return every day to a degree that is kind of hard to believe. But here we have the opposite of this, the contrast of this, the comparison of this, always balancing where especially, I would argue, Melantho, who is brought into and given opportunities as a favorite of the queen, it doesn't take. It reverts to a kind of uh, meanness. Now remember, Eumaeus says at certain points that he was, uh, that his life was one where, you know, he started off as an aristocrat, essentially, and he was a favorite of a, of a sort of, uh, uh, of Laertes. So he was given opportunities, and he proved loyal and worthy of those opportunities. She is taking the opposite route. She is given a, uh, an opportunity. She is given the chance to, you know, rise above her station, perhaps, at least get some nice treatment. But she takes it in the opposite direction. She becomes resentful. She doesn't, she is not appreciative. It's an interesting little dynamic. Um, But their interaction is, I think, very significant. And it's these little moments where you see the fate bearing down on everyone, where the inevitability that we have been working towards is getting closer and closer, and we can see it. And you're just kind of waiting for, all right, when's he going to kill? When's he going to kill? When's he going to kill? And it's very easy to start skimming over all this stuff. So when's he going to kill? When's he going to kill? But it's these little moments that sneak in, in that, 
that I think are way more interesting than the killing itself. Killing is great, but the little things that come almost tangentially to it, that's where it becomes fun. Uh, she started to insult Odysseus and taunt him. Poor old stranger, you are insane. You do not want to sleep out in the smithy or in a public shelter. Instead, you come here talking high and mighty among this crowd of men. Are you not scared? Wine may have dulled your senses, or perhaps you have old, you always say such idiotic things. Has your defeat of Eris made you crazy, that beggar? Then watch out, a better man may, may fight you soon and punch your face so hard that you will be kicked out of this house all drenched in blood. You know, uh, picking on an old man. An old man who's, you know, uh, a, a little bit stronger than first thought, but still. <laughs> Odysseus scowled back and said, you little dog. And again, most other translations will use the word bitch. For that this one sort of glides past that you little dog i will soon go and tell telemachus what you've said so he can slice you limb from limb boy that got out of hand real fast you know she was just talking some smack to him and now suddenly he's going in a dark direction with this slice you limb from limb That made the women tremble with fear. They, they thought he spoke the truth. They scattered through the house. He took his stand behind, beside the braziers to keep them lit. He is literally, at this point, watch where different characters stand for some reason. We talked a little bit about how Penelope is always standing next to a pillar because she supports the household. Here, he's standing next to the fire, and he wants to make sure that they stay lit. He is stoking his own anger. Now, there's something, again, disturbingly sadistic in this. He is planning, um, he, he's planning a massacre. I mean, we are inside the minds of a killer right now. And it's not that different, quite honestly, to go in, in, in a somewhat shocking direction. He is planning a wholesale slaughter very logically, and thinking of, okay, you know, how do I make sure they are the, at the most vulnerable they can? I have to hide all the weapons. I have to lock things out. I need to lock them in one place so that I can just go and pick them off. It's a school shooting. <coughs> and he is the killer. And we are, in a way rooting for him at this time, as disturbing as that is. He has one other thing in this uh, book 18 that I find really interesting. Uh, he gets into a little conversation with, I think, Eurymachus where he talks, you know, uh, again, guy stuff, a little bit of a pissing contest. He says, yeah, Eurymachus, if, if it was you and me, and we could go out in the field, you know, I, I could, uh, I could, what, I could farm better than you. I could out-harvest you. You know, guy stuff. But then he goes and he finds a new metaphor. Okay, the harvesting seems good. You're out there with a little skiff or whatever, and shucking wheat i don't know um that's a nice little image for i could out shuck you but then he goes to um or if zeus suddenly made war begin tomorrow and i had two spears a shield and a helmet all of bronze close fitting to my head you would see me amid the throng of fighters at the front and you would not hurl insults at my belly he immediately goes back to uh, war imagery. He has this little toss-out metaphor of farming, which is as domestic as you can get, really, for a guy. But then just under the surface of that, you scratch it, 
and he comes out with, I can outfight you. And a lot of this story has been about him coming back from war, not just coming home, but leaving war behind. And it's never behind. Because all of that acting out, all of that rashness, all of that, you going to hurt me, I'm going to kill you, is a battlefield mentality. It's, it's PTSD. You know, he can't quite sit still. He can't quite trust anyone. He is very quick to be very violent. Look at the headlines. It's not hard to see what he is actually trying to suppress. And he needs to get there. He needs to get to a point where he can quell that instinct. So it's not just his ego that he needs to restrain. It's an instinct born of 10 years of war. And then another 10 on top of that of being alone and fighting mentally. You can see him always getting ground down on that point. And when he is raw and perhaps not expecting it, that violent, core of his cracks through. But between those two, between his one punch laying out of the other beggar, which is sort of funny, and well, the beggar, Melantho, a, a question of uh, hostility towards women, a question of virility in a very real sense. I am a man because that woman spoke to me rudely, so I'm going to beat her down. And then this other sense of the warrior who is having trouble adapting to civilian life again. All of these are bound up in notions of Manliness, andra, virility. What does it mean to be a man? And he's still struggling with that. You can see him cracking out of it. He doesn't understand just yet. 